everybody. This is your boy Faith of Sam, and we're back with another one. This is tap to tap to tap. Tap in. Uh, like I said before, it's our first time being live, so we apologize for the delay. Uh, but we have a awesome one tonight. Uh, I'm here chilling with the crew, man. What's up? What are you doing, y'all boys? It's your favorite host, the greatest host. Here we go, like throwing this word around. Big crazy, man. Big crazy. I know y'all miss me. I know, I know y'all love me. It's all cool. I appreciate the love and all. Uh, <laughs> 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 what is cool, though? I'm going to be humble today. Go ahead, doctor. Hey, it's a girl, Big Ames. <laughs> 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 Not the little one. <laughs> Hello, everybody. This is your favorite host. Oh, my God. The most beautiful one, Evie. Just Evie. Like I said, we have a special guest today. Um, Dot, go ahead and introduce her real quick. Okay, so our special guest today is a wife, Crystal Thornley, a woman of God. Mm. She has two degrees, a bachelor's in social and a master's in administration. She has been a licensed minister for over a decade. She is an HGBC native, and she hosts weekly prayer calls. She is based in Claremont, Florida, and she is a Zoom instructor. Everybody say hello to me. Thomas, to Flo. What's up, Flo? Not much, man. What's, what's going on? What's going on over there? We good. We good. Man, it's such a pleasure to have you on Tap In. Thank you for answering the call. Likewise. Thank you for the invitation. Always. So, um, you know, like we've been friends and I've been following, even though we've been apart for a minute, been following for a minute. Uh, love what you're doing, you know, with your um, the Zumba classes, you know, taking you know care of your body. Uh, but the spiritual mind is what I've been intrigued by for years. Um, you know, you headstrong about God. And um, so talk about it a little bit. You know, how did you get into ministry? Um, so, of course, uh, a lot of my roots started at HEBC, um, you know, choir and dance ministry and um, MTM. Shout out to MTM. Um, Bird. MTM. <laughs> Um, you know, the youth choir, chosen mass choir. Um, yep, so that was, that was like my that was my introduction to really like getting into church and really tapping into up oh, that's that word, tap in. That's it, tap, tap in, in, tap in. Tap <laughs> tapping into just being faithful to the things of God. Um, I wouldn't say that I was all the way in relationship with God when I was at HEBC. It was more like religious for me. Just, okay, we have church. We got to go to church. We have choir rehearsal. But I thank God for that pattern of behavior. Because when I moved to Kentucky, I still had that regimen of, I need to be in church. I need to be in Sunday school. I need to get plugged in. Because that was what we did for fun. You know, we weren't really right. hanging out. Um, so even though at the time I didn't really know God for real, I knew that that's something that I needed to tap into um so moving to kentucky even though it started out as behavior as far as like a, a routine something clicked for me um and that was you know shout out to tt and nadine we we moved from um, florida to kentucky together and we fell into what i call a holiness church didn't know anything about holiness being saved sanctified filled with the holy spirit speaking in tongues you know really didn't know much about having a calling but being at that church, especially in the beginning years of college, where you're learning who you are, you're learning your identity, like you're you're like a fish out of water. You know, you're learning how to pay bills, you're learning how to drive, you're learning how to establish all of those things while also establishing your identity in Christ. And for me, that's that's when it that's when it clicked for me that I needed God and I needed to get to know God in a real way. Um, and through prayer, through reading my scriptures, through talking to my pastor at the time trying to really understand what is the Bible saying? Like, who are these people and what what is who is God? Really trying to find out who God is versus the God that I 
heard about versus the God that I used to kind of, you know, how we flirt with God sometimes, but we never really mm -hmm. get into a relationship. You know, I spent so many years flirting with God to where I was like, I really want to commit to relationship. I really want to live this thing out. Um, so it definitely came with asking a lot of questions and really being for real about it. Um, and the way God does things, you don't even really know when it actually happens, but you just know when it does. And that's kind of what happened for me. I can't tell you the exact day that my life changed. I'm just happy that it happened. Yeah. You know, hearing you talking about, you know, uh, that foundation and stating the word flirting with God. I think when we're young, we think we have all the time in the world. We're like, you know, let me dab into the little sin here and there. I could always ask for forgiveness, right? Because mm -hmm. I have time, right? So talk mm -hmm. about that a little bit because I think it's naive of us to think that because we are young that we don't need to take God serious at that moment, you know, and we fall into a lot of things that we shouldn't have fallen into had we, you know, take that, you know, step and say that I must stand strong you know, to my beliefs and what the Bible says and what God is calling me to do. Talk about mm -hmm. that a little bit. So I think that because we are young, we don't have the time. Because if you think about our moms, grandparents, great grandparents, if it was being preached back then that Jesus Christ is soon to come. And if that was back in, in their early 20s and now they're 50, 60, 70, those of us who are coming up in our 20s and our 30s and our 40s, we don't have that time because if Jesus was soon to come back in our grandparents, great grandma, church mothers, you know, the, 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 the women's choir. If it was preaching then that Jesus is soon to come, those of us coming up now, we don't have that time. We don't have that extra 40 years that our great grandparents and our parents and our aunties and the church mothers have because we're coming in on the tail end of Jesus is soon to come. So for me, um, what, what, what really was a wake up call for me was losing my mom at such a young age. It taught me then that life is short. Like it taught me then at 14, I knew at an early age, I ain't got that kind of time to waste. Because I didn't think that my mom was going to leave me at 14. Like, you think you're going to have your parents forever. So from more of a personal side for me, that personal event really showed me that time is not on our side. Like, life is short. If you're going to do it, do it right. If you're going to serve God, serve him right 100%. Because we don't have that kind of time. To know that I've been in ministry over a decade and just to know that when I first got into ministry... It was live right, straight and narrow. God is soon to come, you know, fire and brimstone 10 years ago. So we're closer and closer to that. So yeah. to all of, you know, the people under the sound of my voice in your 20s, you ain't got that kind of time. We see it now with the way time is changing, with the way technology is advancing, with the way jobs are advancing. Now you don't even have to leave your house to make a decent living because things are evolving. And the more things evolve, the more we know that the Bible is real and everything he said in his word, we're seeing it now. The earthquakes and the tsunamis and all of the terrorist attacks, like that's all in Revelation. So we're living in that time now. So we ain't got that kind of time just because we're young. That's more of an urgency because we're closer to that end of Jesus coming more than our, you know, aunties and uncles and people who have been saved for years. We don't have that kind of time. So it's more of an urgency for us as young people to really get what we can get from God because our time with God is shorter than the time that, you know, our aunties, uncles, you know, the people we think are old, yeah. they've had all that time with God. We don't have that time. So we got to experience him, get what we're going to get, you know, be in position for the promise, be in position for the prophecies that have been spoken over your life. So you can experience that on the earth. Cause we, we got like buckets with God. We don't have a whole well of time with him. Yeah. And as you were, you know, speaking earlier, you mentioned your mother. Um, and, you know, the thing about trauma is that, you know, sometimes it takes us to like this rabbit hole that we cannot climb out of. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, but your testimony is a little different. So if you don't mind revisiting, you know, um, that time, uh, can you talk a little bit about what happened and, you know, give us a little details um, on, you know, uh, what happened with your mom? Absolutely. So little bit about my mom. My mom, you know, single mother. Um, I'm a product of a single mother home. Um, my mom and my dad, they were married for a short period of time. 
Um, I think they got married because they had children, which was very common in, you know, for for Haitian yeah, African American culture. culture. You know, mm -hmm. it's very it's very common. You know, if you have a baby, then it's like you got to get married. You got to do it the right way. Um, yeah. Knowing that that wasn't even the right way, trying to cover up seeing you get deeper into mess. Um, and I don't think you know our generation, our culture, believe that. You know, it's it's more of like a image thing. You know, we get caught up in mm -hmm. the image more than the actual impact so we spend so much time in imagery that we don't realize the impact of things so my parents got married um i'm the oldest of four on my dad's side but i also have two siblings um with from my mom that have di different dads um shout out to my brother harrison and nancy hey y'all um What's up, but, bro? um they got married you know because again she had children and um it was a very, very tumultuous time. You know, I, I've seen my father abuse my mom um, countless times because he was, you know, didn't want to work a traditional nine to five. If y'all could pick up what I'm putting down and tap into what I'm saying. Yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> he didn't want to work that traditional nine to five. He was a musician. You know, he was a street hustler. But, you know, when you don't work nine to five, you don't have consistent income where my mom was a nurse working hard. So it was a lot of issues in the home about money she was making and money he was spending and how the math just wasn't mathing. Um, so growing up in that environment, you know, it started early for me. Trauma started really early for me. It started with seeing my dad abuse my mom. Then it started with, you know, them getting a divorce and then it led into the daddy issues of I'm coming for your birthday. I promise I'm going to be there, you know. I did everything except for sit on the front porch waiting on my dad. You know, I remember sitting in the living room, shoes on, book bag on, waiting for him to come. And it, and if it wasn't him, it would be an auntie days later. So um, that pattern of trauma and people letting you down and people hurting you, that started early for me to where it, even now I have to seek God intentionally that I don't start to put up a wall when I feel like people let me down or when I feel like people don't meet expectations. So fast forward, that's childhood trauma or early childhood trauma with abusive father, you know, single mother working hard at this time. She had four children, immigrant um, from Haiti, came here, you know, started the nursing thing and was working her way up. And then, of course, when you're a single mom, you know, not all single moms deal with this, but a lot of single parents, you know, you feel like you need some help. And a lot of times you seek for that in companion. So my mom introduced us to so many different Man, you know, she was a great mother, you know, that takes nothing from her. But the more she would fall for a guy, the more that men will come into the home, the more we met so many. This is uncle such and such. This is Mr. Such and such. I had so many uncles and misters more than I could count. Um, <laughs> but she met this one guy. She met this guy. He was at a really popular church, really big church in Palm Beach, you know, um, born and raised in West Palm Beach. So that's where I was before I moved to Homestead. And um, I won't say the name of the church just to protect the that, you know, congregation. The image but, of the church, yeah. Um, he was a deacon at the church. He had, a, he had a son. You know, he was nice. He took us to the movies, got us gummy worms. You know, when, when you're young like that, all it takes is gummy bears and some chips. That's it. And Candy. a couple dollars. And, you know, that that's all it takes for you to feel like, oh, yes, this, is, this must be our quote-unquote dad. So they dated for, that was her longest relationship. So for all of us, we thought that this was it. You know, um, she took her time with introducing him to us. She took her time with moving him in. So we really thought that this was a thing. Um, after about a year or two of them dating, he proposed. So we're like, okay, you know, this is starting to be something great. Um, after the proposal, it was like a sudden switch. It was almost like, now that I have her, I can try to control her. So then the control started with who she was friends with. The control started with where she was going. It was like he was almost tracking her in a way that was very different from what he showed us in the beginning. Um, she had a really close friend that he was trying to sever that tie. Um, her and my grandma, you know, they started to have issues in their relationship because we wouldn't really go around much. It was almost like he was trying to isolate us to just him. Um, so after about a couple months of that, my mom got tired. Um, and she decided to end the relationship with him. Um, but she ended the relationship in a way that my grandma was advising her to seek out protection. 
because he was he would threaten her. He would say things like, if I can't have you, no one else will. I've invested so much of my life in you and your children, you know, and you just think that, you know, you can go ahead on and leave. I've paid so many bills in your house. Like he just started to go down a list of all of the things that he did and why she just owed him her life. Oh. Um, so my mom was working two jobs at the time. Because single mother, you know, going through a breakup, not wanting to depend on the guy anymore. So she was working two jobs at the time and she left, went to work. My mom never would go home. I don't know if y'all have Haitian parents like my mom, like my mom, but we packing lunch. We sitting here preserving gas. We ain't doing all that traveling back and forth. But for some reason that day on August 1st of 2004, she went back home on her lunch. And when she went back home on her lunch, Every single door in the house was open. Front door, back door, um, all the little secret doors that we had, um, all the windows were open, like wide open. Like you would have thought that everybody in the house left through a door and forgot to shut it behind them, like completely open. She called my grandma and my grandma was telling her, listen, don't go back home. Do not go back home because he's showing you that even though you took back the keys, even though you said you're over with him, you're done with him, he still has access to you. Now, this next part I'm getting ready to say is not to combat anybody that has faith because we can have faith. We can believe God's going to protect us. We can trust that God's going to cover us. But that's why there is police. There is court. There is Talk restraining orders because you have to obey the laws of the land. You have to secure yourself while we trust God, while we believe God. We can't have foolish faith. So, and, my and you know, God, it's, a, it's uh, coming in our culture. Sorry to cut you off, but it's coming mm -hmm. in our culture. I'm glad you said that because a lot of times, even our older folks, they are sick, but they'll tell you that I'm praying, right? But the doctor exactly. tell them they, they need to have a surgery. You know what I mean? Exactly. And we we can't like, God can use doctors, God can use lawyers, God can use attorneys, God can use a surgeon, God can use police officers, God can use medication, God can use all of that because the Bible says all things were created by him and for him. So we can't just have all this faith. Then the Bible even says faith without works is dead. So right. my mom pulled the faith card. Oh, in the name of Jesus, I'm going to my house. My house is covered by the Lord. You know, I'm going to plead the blood of Jesus and I'm going to go to sleep because I have to wake up the next morning because she was also in school to become a registered nurse. My grandma pleaded with her, begged her and said, just come to my house. This was during Hurricane, uh, Hurricane Rita, I believe. Um, she said, just come to my house. Don't go back. I don't have a good feeling. My mom completely disobeyed that and she went home anyway. When she pulled up to the house, we had, thank God for nosy neighbors, we had a nosy neighbor across the street. And he walked over to my mom's car. He said, Marie, I don't think you should go in there because I seen, to, to remain nameless, I seen him and he was kind of like marking his territory. And I don't know, something about it was looking really weird because if he has access to the home, he didn't, he didn't come here the way he normally would. So I, so they knew something was different. And she was like, no, it's okay. It's no problem. Made an excuse for him, covered up, went home. So this was August 1st of 2004. So she, which my mom goes home. She was supposed to take um, a, a test the next day. So she called my grandma and said, I checked the house. I checked everything. Nobody's here. I'm covered by the blood. Jesus, Jesus has me and I, I'm, I'm okay. So she goes to bed. She goes to bed. And then the next morning, my aunt, who was in school with my mom, they used to carpool from West Palm Beach to Miami. Um, they, she called, she called, she called, she called, she called, she called my grandma. She called us. She was like, hey, have y'all talked to your mom? Because this is a really big day. I know she's been working extra shifts. Maybe she overslept. We don't want to leave her. But we, you know, we can't stay. I've knocked on the door. I've knocked on her room door. I've knocked on the windows. And she's just not responding. And we can't be late because that was the day of their final exam. And anyone who's in nursing school, you know, being on time and doing your finals, you have to be punctual. So they mm -hmm. called, they called, they called. My grandma called. And this is like five, six in the morning because they have to be at school at like eight. And um, my grandma said, just go ahead and go. You know, if, if we don't hear from her by, you know, a certain time, we'll send you know, Serge, which is my uncle, would send him to, you know, go check on her because he was in Fort Lauderdale at the time. Now, 
funny thing about my uncle is he was actually living with us. And remember, I told y'all this man did everything to isolate my mom from her family and her friends. He right. did so much to where he pretty much gave my mom an ultimatum. Either you pick me or your brother. And wow. she ended up putting my she ended up putting my uncle out. Um, he also got into it with my older brother. And it was the same thing. It was either me or them. Like he just was really possessive. So fast forward, we everybody's calling, trying to get a hold of her. We all know something is like wrong because one thing about my mom, she's not gonna she's not gonna miss something that important. She's thinking about her four babies at home. She's thinking about, you know, making more money. She's thinking about I I'll be able to go down to one job and I can spend more time with family. Like she's really thinking about the fruits of her labor and how it's going to benefit her children. Mm -hmm. So it's like 10, 10 30 now, 5 a.m. The crew comes to pick my mom up, calling, calling, calling for about an hour. Can't get a hold of her. They end up having to leave because they're also students as well and they got to take their tests. So it's like 10 o'clock. And um, I remember I was in River Oaks, good old River Oaks, <laughs> um, River Oaks. <laughs> getting my hair done. And I was at my aunt's house. Um, shout out to T. My son. I was at my aunt's house getting my hair done. And um, I just remember my grandma called my aunt and she just went to screaming. And of course, at 14, I'm like, you know, you you just think Haitians do a lot of weird stuff. I can say that because I'm Haitian. <laughs> they, they be real extra about stuff. So right. you're not thinking that you're not thinking the worst. Right. Yeah. You're, you're, I'm just thinking this is another person calling from Haiti and needs something like I'm not thinking that this is something with my mom. So. Mm -hmm. She stopped what she was doing, loaded us all in her car, and drove to my grandma's house. My grandma was living off of 305th Street by Racetrack, over there by Camel Drive. And we get over there, and all my mom kept saying was, your mom got killed. He killed your mom. He killed your mom. And at 14, I just know that I went numb because I couldn't process it. I was like, what do you mean he killed my mom? Like, I thought he loved her. I thought... He was, you know, going to marry her. I thought that he was wanting to make her happy. I thought that he was, he cared about us. If he cared about us, how could he do that? How could he, you know, take the only thing that he knows that we have? Like, we don't have, you know, a dad here to, to take care of us. Like, how could he do that? Like, how? So we learn more about what actually happens and not to be too graphic to just not to scare you all, um, yeah. but... This is, no, the good you're thing. Good, you're good. this is the good thing about deliverance. You you can talk about trauma and still feel victorious while you talk about it because you just know God used that to get you to where you are. Um, so my uncle, my grandma called my uncle and he was and she told him, I haven't heard from Helen all day. She missed a really important test. Um, I don't know how soon you, you can get to the house, but you have to get there. Now, my uncle, who would never come to my mom's house with company, for some reason, he just felt really strong that he shouldn't go by himself. So he had a really good friend of his, and he told his friend, I think you need to drive because I don't have a good feeling. Drove the 45 minutes from Lauder Hill to my, to, to my mom's house um, in Palm Beach County, pulled up to the house, and it was like pitch black, everything dark, which anyone who knows my mom, after... After the sun comes up, curtains are up, lights is on, you know, music is playing. Like, it's a lot of life and activity and movement in the house. And this is at, this is close to two, three o'clock when my uncle finally gets the chance to go and check on my mom. So because he used to live there, he knew how to get in the house. You know, we all got those extra ways we can get into the house and we ain't got no key. <laughs> so he knew how to get into the house. And he knocked on the door. The door was locked. And he went through, climbed through the, it was a bathroom window that was kind of broken. And he sl slid the window up, went through the window and her bedroom door was locked. Now my mom used to lock the door only when she would leave the house because her four kids would go in the room and be rummaging through her little snacks and stuff. So she had to lock the door. Um, and my uncle knocked on the door, knocked on the door and, and finally he kicked the door open and he found my mom laying on the floor in a puddle of her own blood, dead. And I remember when my uncle finally got to us, you could tell that 
he was having an out of body experience because he's the youngest. Um, my mom was also his godmother um, and pretty much his best friend. And he was the one who found her and the guilt that he felt at the time because they were not on speaking terms because she had picked this man over him. And wow. when he was leaving, he felt like he shouldn't have left. But at that point, what do you do? Wow. Um, so to live with that, you know, at 14, um, that is why I say the reality of life being short for me, it was sudden yeah. because just the day before, like we talked to my mom. You know, we she was talking about all the stuff she bought for us and how she can't wait for us to come back home and how we were we were we were supposed to be there. It wasn't like we were on a break from school. It was the hurricane and we had to evacuate. But my mom was considered an essential worker. So that's why she was there. And that's why we weren't there. So when I say the reality of life being short at 14, it wasn't like I lost a friend from school. It wasn't like my mom was sick. It wasn't like she was in an accident. Like she went home to lay in her bed and somebody was in the house waiting for her. God. Yeah. God. You know, um, I, I'm recalling now because, you know, we used to hang out a lot, me, you and Chichit. Mm -hmm. And I remember how protective your uncle was with you and, and Harry. So mm -hmm. now it makes sense. Mm -hmm. It makes a lot of sense that he was so protective of you guys that, you know, even if you step your foot outside the door, like he wanted to make sure that, you know, where you going and mm -hmm. who you going with and, you know, like, you know, what you guys about to do and, you know, how well do you know this person? I remember he drilled Chit because Chit was, you know, um, uh, I think me and Chit was the oldest of all of us. Right. Mm -hmm. He used to drill us with questions just to make sure to know, you know, where we come from and who our family is before mm -hmm. we can even hang out with you guys. And that explains a whole lot. Flo, at 14 years old for you to experience something like that, most 14 year olds uh, don't come back from that. Mm -hmm. So what was that process? And, you know, speak to somebody that might be going through that trauma right now, but feel stuck. And feel, you know, that everything, you know, that they they love, you know, is gone and that they have nothing else to live for. Speak to that um, portion of the, the listeners. So for me at 14, what was a turning point for me? Um, the day that my mom left us was October 2nd of 2004. Um, I want to say... That's usually the month where we have Moisson at HEBC. Um, and my cousin Katia was a member at HEBC at the time. And I just knew that I needed to surround myself with positivity because it was when I went home, my grandma, she's a wreck. You know, my sister is a wreck crying, emotional, my older brother acting out, younger brother acting out. Like, I just knew I needed positivity. Like I knew, I didn't even know what that looked like, but I thank God that I was able to surround myself with people that wanted to live, like people that wanted to do more, people that were looking for better, people that, like I really wanted to surround myself with people who didn't even know my trauma, so they didn't have to ask me about it. Like, I don't know if it was all the way healthy the way that I did it, but I was just wanting to escape that. Like, I was wanting to, I, I don't want to think about it. I don't want to think about it. I, I don't want to revisit it. I don't want to deal with it. Like, I didn't want to drown in it. So what I would tell the 14, the 15, the 16-year-old, the 36-year-old, the 45-year-old, the 50-year-old, because when you don't deal with trauma, you can be 50 and still 14 because yeah. you get stuck in a time frame. You can be 95 and still be eight and stuck in a time frame. So I would encourage anyone when you when it comes to trauma, you cannot worship it. You cannot make it your every day. You cannot sit and soak in it. You cannot. And I'm not saying that you got to mask it and be fake about it, but you got to get up. You got to find something to do. 
my something to do was church. My something to do was, I know I can't go out because my, my grandma don't play that. But if I tell her I'm going to church and Pastor Reggie and Pastor Alice is going to pick me up and I can be at church for hours, even though I'm not on the praise and worship team, even though I'm not, you know, on the dance ministry, if I can just sit and be outside of my environment for just a couple hours, that was enough to fill my cup. So you have to find something that can fill your cup with the positivity. Like it's, I challenge everybody that is dealing with trauma. It's easy to stay there because some of us, we may not want to admit it, Sam, but we like to play victim. Victims get hugs and they get pats on the back and they get, yeah. you know, cash apps and Zells and Venmos and they get, you know, a little rub on the back here and they get like, they get coddled and they get attention. and as much as we want that, we can't use trauma to get that. So I would encourage you, ma'am, sir, whoever, your trauma has already identified that time of your life. Find something else. I wanted, to, I didn't want to be known as the girl who, Mike Kelly's daughter who got killed in Palm Beach. I wanted to be known for something else. Not mm -hmm. to drown my mother's legacy, not to, you know, silence who my mom was, because my mom is always going to be that girl to me. But I didn't want to be known as that. So you shouldn't want to be known as the girl who had a miscarriage or as the girl who was in an abusive relationship or as the girl who, you know, her, her fiance left her or she went through the divorce. Like, find another narrative and soak in that. Because I didn't want to, I, I didn't, like, I think, Sam, this is your first time hearing my story. This is my first time. I didn't want to be known time. as that girl. I didn't yeah, want to be known true. as that girl. Now, everybody at Batis knew because my mom's funeral was at Batis. But I didn't want to be that girl. Like, I didn't want, I didn't want that to be why people knew me. And I think when you get to the point in your life where you realize how much that trauma hurts you and how much you don't want to be identified by that trauma, you start to find something else to associate yourself with in a healthy way. I'm not saying escape. I'm not saying not to deal with it. Because if I didn't deal with my mom's death, I'd have been on here falling apart. So I dealt with it. I grieved my mom. I did the work. You know, I, I sought the Lord for, for what I needed. But I also sought God for a new identity because I did not want to be labeled as the girl whose mother was murdered by a deacon. I didn't want that to be who people knew me as. And evident today, Sam, who I used to sing in voice with and the choir with, you know, me, him, Bird, Titchett, Farah. This is probably the, the first crew. time for a lot of people yeah. to really know my mom's story, to really know what brought me and my sister to HEBC. I didn't want I didn't want that to be. I didn't want that to be my title. So you got to find what do you want your life to be like, you know, and if you don't know right now, pray about it. Pray about it. Really seek God for it. Because I knew at 14 that there was more to life than me dwelling on the murder of my mom. Like I knew almost instantly. And now at almost 34, I know it was God. But at the time, I just knew it's, it's got to be more. It's got to be more than just crying and, and grieving and being depressed. And, you know, I want to have something positive to say. I, I, I want to be known for other things. Um, and that's what that's what pushed me. It, it wasn't even about trying to be rich. It was like, I want to be known for something else. Different. I, I Yeah, I, I just want to be known for something different. I don't want to every time people see me. Oh, let me give you a hug. You know, oh, you know, it's so sad. I didn't want to be known for that. Like, I wanted you to see me and be like, man, God did his big one on her. Yeah. And, and yeah. I let him do it. Yeah. Um. Uh, so, Flo, I want to apologize for my team because they do get, you know, silent when they hear these stories. I don't know why. They don't, they're not usually <laughs> like this. They have lots of questions, lots of input. But for some reason or another, when I have a guest on here, they don't know what to say. <laughs> yeah they'd be stuck in the testimony you know and, and your testimony is something that is hard to hear but it's necessary right because mm -hmm. it happens on a daily basis right there's people mm -hmm. that are dealing with that on a daily basis and I, like i'm so happy that you know it did not become you it did not define who you are mm -hmm. and now standing here as a woman of god but more than right 
Uh, mm-hmm. Speak on the fact that you have a great husband, right? Great, that you man, guys been man, married. Man. <laughs> Thank you, you guys to my been man. married. Thank you too, me. <laughs> you guys been married for a long time, mm-hmm. and what you went through and experiencing, you know, what your mother experienced because you were there as well as a child, but mm-hmm. you were there in that experience, and that experience could have caused you to fall into the same thing that she was falling into, but mm-hmm. that. But that didn't happen. So talk talk about that. Like, what about you that was different? And where did you say, okay, this generational curse or whatever have you is is cutting with me? Like, I'm I'm stopping it with me. So, um, not to sound like a broken record, but it was nothing but God. Let's go. Because for one, and that that just gave me chills. For one, when that happened, I didn't want to date nobody. I didn't want to be with nobody. I didn't want to be with like. Trust me, I remember we were, we were we were in high school together. <laughs> I remember the ones you were shutting down. Like it was <laughs> like no, like when it came to men and men being clingy, it just yeah. triggered me because it made me think about how my mom's relationship started with that guy and how mm-hmm. it ended. So I didn't trust men. I felt like y'all just going to do a whole lot of talking game. And then once y'all get us in love with y'all, y'all finna go ahead on and just flip it up. Like I was very rigid and toxic in my mindset when it came to men. So much so that I actually thought that I was going to date a woman. Oh boy. I absolutely thought that that was the only way that I could find and receive love because I was, my image of men was so distorted between my biological father being abusive and then the men that came in in between the the deacon that my mom dated, those men that came between cheating, married, my mama was, you know, side piece and didn't know it. And then, you know, seeing my, my, my brothers and my cousins, like I was there with, they got one girl on the phone and then the other girl on the other phone. Like, I done seen a lot of... Don't like, put them out like that. I done seen a lot of, you know, like, this person, oh, I'm going to call you back. I'm, I'm, I'm getting ready to go to sleep. Phone ring again. It's another girl. Oh, and I'm no. like, like, I seen too much. <laughs> I, seen, I seen too much and not in a good way. You know, yeah. like, from just my dad to my cousins and siblings and you know the men that my mom dated in between and then the ultimate to know that not only was it a man but it was a deacon a, a spiritual leader like spiritual leader at that you're the first one at the church and the last one to leave like you are putting your you putting your pastor's bible on the pulpit before he preach you're covering your pastor before he goes out to speak you're in the office with him. You giving him his water, his towel. Like that is who did what he did to my mom. So you're talking about layers and different caliber of men that I seen. That it just was like y'all ain't y'all ain't right. To where I in, in my brain, in my mind, there was this life of me being in a same sex relationship because I could not and did not trust that a man could come and do what he say he's going to do and be a man of God. At, at, at that point in my life, I was just, again, relation, like religiously going to church because that was my way to get out of the house. Yo, it's I, didn't have no, I didn't have no commitment to God because in my mind, like you let a spiritual leader do this to my mom. So this is just, th- this is no different than going to the mall. Like going to HEBC, that was like, oh, I'm just going to the mall today and I'm getting cute. And we, you know, like it just was an outing for me. It was never anything that I truly believed in. God and a relationship with a man was so far from what I even subscribed to because of what happened to my mom. Uh But when I say it was nothing but God, like if you ask my husband, he'll tell you that we've been together for like 16 years. Because he pursued me for like three, and I was like, "No, nah, good, exactly, no." And but funny thing is, my husband is is from Alabama, you know. So if you ever met like a, a southern man, country, but like 
poised, professional. I don't think he started wearing jeans until me and him got together. Like he's you, he's just slacks, you know, your boat shoes, suit jacket, sport jacket, like Let's go. clean, like clean. And in my head, when he came to the church and everybody was like, oh my gosh, look at him, look at Brother Clay. Oh, he got a nice car. He got this, got that. I'm over there like, child, bye. Anybody think about that? Like, <laughs> not at all. Um, but because of my mom's experience with men that were married and also dating her, because of my mom's experience with men who weren't faithful and then, you know, abusive, in my head, because of how he was so put together, I just knew he was married. Like, I'm like, oh, no, he married. He trying to make me his little side piece. I'm not going to do it. And I was so against it. But the turning point, again, nothing but God. It was Christmas of 2000 and 2010. The dates. Um, I couldn't afford to go back home, struggling college student. You know, anybody who's a full-time college student, y'all know the struggle. No. Uh, and... I was home. And again, you know, we, we were at the same church, so we all fellowship together. And everybody knew Brother Clay Light Flow, Brother Clay Light Flow, Brother Clay. Everybody knew. And um, one of the ministers at, at the church, shout out to Felicia McGee, she pulled me to the side. She was like, hey, you know, because I know that, you know, um, you're not, you know, going home, you know, and I really don't want the enemy to creep in and have depression happen for you. So I'm having to get together at my house. You know, we're all kind of pulling names out of a hat to do a secret Santa and we're all just bringing a dish. You know, it doesn't matter what you bring or if you can't bring anything, just come because it's on my heart to invite you because I really don't want you to be like home alone during the holidays because everybody knew about my mom's story in Kentucky. So I came and then she was like, okay, well, before you you come, you got to pull the name out the bag. So I pull the name out the bag and it's Clarence McGahee is my <laughs> secret Santa. And I'm like, I don't want to buy him nothing. Like, no, because then he going to take it the wrong way and think it's something bigger than what it is. And we ain't even going to do that. He already in my inboxes and messaging me. Like, I don't want to send mixed signals because I'm not interested. But right. to be a sport, a team sport, you know, I went to Walmart and got the man of God a little tie. You know, shout Golly, out to him Walmart <laughs> Got him a little Walmart tie, put it in the bag. And, you know, I went to the house. Now, I was extremely late because it was snowing and it was just like, you know, it was just a rough holiday for me. But I pressed my way through and went. Um, so fast forward, go. I, I go to the gathering, walk in and everybody's like, oh, Flo, there go Clay. Clay, there go Flo. Y'all know how people be real petty. When they know two people in the room that they're trying to like make a love connection. Mm -hmm. So we got ready to do the gift exchange. And of course, they're like, well, Flo, since you came late, you can give your gift first. So I gave the gift and I said, hey, here, here Clay, you know, you're, you're my secret Santa. Merry Christmas. So I gave him his gift and he had somebody different. But he was like, I still got you something because God put it on my heart to get you something. Oh, boy. And uh, it was a card. And I opened the card. And he was like, you can read this on your own time. But, you know, he specifically said it was almost like I knew this man was praying for me because I had such a rough Christmas morning thinking about my mom, missing my mom. He said, because I know holidays are hard for you without your mom. I wanted you to know that somebody's thinking of you. Oh, uh, um, so you know, my daughter's food. <laughs> so read the card again. At that time in my life, I was really praying like, Lord, if this is the man that you have for me, he will know what I need based on how he prays and has relationship with you. So that was number one. I, I had a rough morning, spent the morning crying my eyes out, sad because it was Christmas time and you see everybody on with their family. And I was already alone and it was cold and I'm from Florida. So I cried every winter. It was too cold. <laughs> so sign number one, he got a card and he specifically spoke to an issue that I was dealing with that morning, missing my mom. Number two, told you I was a struggling college student. So opened the card. And at the time, I had a bill that was past due and I didn't know how I was going to pay it. And the bill was a little bit under, like it was like $98 and some change. Opened the card and it was a hundred dollars in the card. Mm. And when I opened the card, he was like, I told you open it later. Cause I don't want people in your business. But he leaned in. He was like, you know, that was just on my heart to, to not buy you anything, but you know, you can use the money for whatever you need. So he addressed the fact that emotionally I was having a hard day. He was able to know that I needed this to money to take care of a personal matter. 
And then I'm getting ready to leave. It's cold in Kentucky. So he's scraping the ice off my car, turned the heat on in my work. car, had the, had the engine going. And then at one point I was like, where did this man go with my car? Because in my head, I didn't want him to go in my car, y'all, because I had no gas. So I'm like, oh, he can't warm this car up because we don't have no gas. We trying to, we barely making it. Got my car back, y'all. Car gas full with a tank full. Um, it, dude? So, I mean, it was just like every <laughs> everything that I in my mind was dealing with that day. He knew, mind you, we weren't in conversation. He didn't have my number. All he had was Facebook Messenger at the time. And I think that's back when Facebook was college and high school. That's how that's how far back we go. He didn't have any direct access to me to even know that I was struggling emotionally, financially, like came through. And then I had been telling him for years, like, let's just be friends. Like, I'm not really trying to do all that. And he was like really putting the pressure on. But that day after he addressed the fact that I was emotional, he addressed the fact that I had a financial need. Before I left, he said, I'm finally hearing what, you, what you've been saying all these years. And I would just be honored for the friendship. That January, we were officially dating. And then by that next December, we were married. <laughs> <laughs> so it was because I allowed God to work on me. Yeah. And I was looking for God in his pursuit. Like, I, I guess when you get to a point in your life where you have seen so much trauma when it comes to men, it's not a lot that moves you. It's not the dates. It's not, you know, the sweet nothings. It's not, you know, any of that. Like I'm looking for intention. And and I remember praying that God would bless me with a man with intention. And he was so intentional that Christmas, like down to the T intentional. Yeah. And the rest was history from there. But it was nothing but God because I was supposed yeah. to be, you know, I was supposed to be part of, you know, that other community with all the letters. That was, that was, that was my, that was my plan. Like that was what I felt like. That was what I thought love was because what I seen men do to the women in my family and my mom specifically firsthand, I just couldn't see myself being able to lean into that. And if the Lord says the same, December will be 11 years of marriage that my husband and I have been married. Um, and we are the best of friends in every extent of that. We get on each other's nerves. We have the best conversations. Um, at night, I could feel him putting his hands on my head, praying for me before he leaves the house. Um, he supports my ministry. We're also working on another ministry together. Um, he is, has just shown himself to be the epitome of what not only I pray for, but even the things I didn't know how to pray for. He's been that. He's that dude. Shout, shout, out, see, shout, you know, he, he's shout that out. dude. Shout out to Clarence. Shout out. <laughs> <laughs> shout out to Clarence McGahee. Shout out to my dog, man. Um, wow, Flo. Wow. So, man. So, um, I know you have to go. You had to go about twenty minutes ago, but. There, you started this prayer line. Mm -hmm. Okay, how did that come about? And you know what what you've been doing with that? So during COVID, and also moving, because I stated this before. From fourteen, all I knew was church, like Sunday morning, Friday night. I think it was rehearsal some days, so I knew church. And when I first moved from Kentucky to Pensacola, it took me a while to find a church to go to. But then I found a church that I was able to consistently visit. Um, but then when I moved from Pensacola to Claremont, of course, being in a bigger area, it's a little bit harder to find like a church home or somewhere that is you feel like you can be connected with. Because it's a lot of bigger churches here. No problem with bigger mm -hmm. churches. But, you know, sometimes it's hard to feel really connected in such a big space right yes. um and specifically during covid is when everything was like shut down like churches were virtual you couldn't get together and if you did you had to have on a mask every other row every other pew um and i remember just you know still praying still being in my word still seeking god because 
you know, the minister in you, no matter where you are, is there, whether you are actively preaching in a pulpit, whether you're out, you know, witnessing to the homeless, like you always have this fire for God and his people. There's always a message in your belly. There's always words of encouragement. There's always something that you want to say. And for me, I'm not even a Facebook live. My best friend, Kizzy, will tell you, shout out to Kizzy. I don't do, I'm, I'm listen, Facebook ain't my thing. I don't, I don't really like all that. Posting, tagging, sharing video, go live, tap in, press in, share, like, comment. Like, that's not me. I'm very right. like tucked away, you know, chill. And when I heard God say to me, because actually my prayer line started as a Facebook live Wednesdays in the word. Yeah, um, and I would go live on, on Facebook with a little bit of a, a, of a, a, of a word. And then I would pray. Mm -hmm. And then the Lord changed it to a, a prayer line. And the way that that came about was I just began to feel this urge of how a lot of people need an option to be able to tap in, <laughs> they go to the word, to they tap go, in to prayer in a more convenient kind of way, right? Because prayer to me is the one thing that everybody's scared to do. I think if I ask anybody to pray right now, they'd be like, me, why? I ain't trying to pray out loud. Um, but it's something that no one really is confident in doing publicly. Some people don't know how they feel like, I don't know how to pray, I don't know what to say. Um, and a lot of times we look for church for prayer. And if you just wait on Sunday morning, then you go Monday through the whole week, the week without like having like strategic prayer. Mm -hmm. Um, and I just felt this unction, this push to really tap into like, okay, let's, let's get into this prayer call. It was something that my former pastor, she used to call me sometimes when she would have the, she had a prayer line and whenever she couldn't pray, you know, she would call me and say, Hey, I need you to pray on the prayer line and that God took me back to that time and what that time of my life, how I was committed to it, how I felt fueled, how I felt a passion for it. And, um, it's been Wednesdays in the word launched about four years ago. Um, mm -hmm. but the prayer line has been for about, um, three years now we had prayer this morning and every month God gives me a target. Um, cause again, we're, we're talking strategy because what God ministered to me is that a lot of us know how to pray. We know the Lord's prayer, but there isn't really too much intention in that. Mm -hmm. You know, we're just reciting, you know, our father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Like we're just reciting something, yes. but we're not really intentional and it kind of hides us behind the formality. Um, and what my prayer call is specific to is to break through the, those formalities and really tap into what you're dealing with like what is on your heart like since the month of june we've been praying for god to align us align our mind our heart our decision and this morning we were praying about how we always quote the scripture asking god to order our steps in his word and while i said that on prayer the lord began to reveal to me we say that but we don't know his word we don't know what his word looks like we don't know what his word sounds like some of us don't know the voice of god so we started praying, Lord, teach me your voice, teach me your word, help me to get in the word and understand what you're saying to me, because the 23rd Psalms is different to everyone who reads it. So yes. Wednesday morning prayer is all about strategy. It's all about your personal walk with God. And it's all about intention. And we haven't been intentionally praying for about three years. It's at 7 a.m. on Eastern Standard Time. Um, every morning you just call in. I host and pray. Sometimes I invite other prayer warriors to pray on the line with me. Um, and we just, we're just seeking God with strategy. We have strategy for everything. We have strategy for the grocery bill. We have strategy for, you know, how we're going to pay the bills in our house. We have strategy on, on our children. A lot of kids went back to school. So there was strategy around yeah. how many uniforms we're going to buy, you know, okay, this kid going to get this, this kid's going to get that, you know, y'all will have to share this, you know, you strategize in life because without strategy, you fail, you know? The Bible says my people perish for lack of knowledge and knowledge comes from strategy to be able to really sit back and think, what is it going to take for me to get here? And in our culture, African-Americans, Haitian-Americans, you know, all of us, we don't strategize. Mm -hmm. We just get up and we we are the, we have mastered winging it. Yes. And we cannot continue to do that, especially in your prayer life. 
Yeah. If you just get up and wing prayer, like, do you know how many of your family members are going through stuff and they won't ever tell you? But if you seek God intentionally, he'll put them on your heart and allow you to pray in a way that you can cover them and they don't even tell you what they need. That comes from strategy. That comes from being tapped in. That comes from really connecting to the power of God. And that is what we do on Wednesday mornings. We are That's right now strong. actively praying for alignment and what that looks like in our life and our relationship with our children and our finances, you know, in our desires and our goals, you know, putting back, putting God back into that business plan, putting God back into that marriage, putting God back into your church, putting God back into your mind, the way you think, the way you speak. Like we have as a people, myself included, we have gotten out of alignment because we know people, we got money, you know, we can get out there and make it move and shake, but we don't realize that just because we have the capacity to do it, that doesn't mean that God has ordained it for it to be done. And you could be operating in capacity and not be operating in the in the ordination of God. And that's where you get out of alignment. So that's what Wednesday morning prayer is about. I do a little bit of like five to 10 minutes of like a word, a recap. You know, um, if the Lord speaks something prophetically, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll go into that. And then we, we go into prayer. Let's go. And if yeah. anybody wants to log in, what's the what's the um, the information? Like, what is the number they call? So the number to call for, for prayer, let me pull that up because um, I don't have that committed to memory. I do have a flyer, um, okay. but the prayer line is is very simple to log into. There's no access code associated with that. Um, we 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 just made it easy. All you got to do is call in. You ain't even got to mute yourself because I'm going to mute you. It's okay. You, you, ain't even, you ain't even you ain't even got a mute. You know, you can just call in and be in the background, probably yelling and fussing at your children. But the number to call for, for prayer is area code 725 735 Yep. All right. So every Wednesday morning at what time? At 7 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Eastern Standard Time. So yeah. call that number every Wednesday morning and get a prayer in with Flo. Yep. It'll right. be an honor to pray with you all. I tell people this all the time. I don't pray for you all. I pray with you all because you all. those targets yeah. are prevalent to my life as well. It's not Most like definitely. I got it together and I'm just on here. Just know what I'll know. God Pouring is without you God. having to pour back in, into yourself. Absolutely. No, I got you. So, um, Zumba, I know dancing was a big thing for you, mm -hmm. right? But I've never seen Zumba in your future. So how did <laughs> Zumba come about? <laughs> oh, man. So, um, look, I told Sam not to call me this, but I'm going to say it. Um, <laughs> I have been nugget. I have been nugget. Um, all of my... I would say teenage into like early adulthood because I was short and I was round. Um, a little bit. I'm also light skin. And, you know, so they would always say, you like a little golden nugget. <laughs> um, and when I moved to college, um, you know, you gained that freshman. Some people say freshman 15. For me, it was that freshman 65. Okay. You, you, you gain that weight. You know, um, one thing about me, one of my love languages is food. I love good food. You know, you know, as Haitians, yes. we love good season yeah. food. You know, we, we love our rice, our tea, call it pois, you know, yes. tea, like love. We love our carbs. We are some carbonated people in the Haitian culture. Mm -hmm. But um, for me, again, going, going back to college, when I said I was a struggling college student, I knew that I needed to do something to lose weight. Um, and I, there was a YMCA right around the corner from my house and I was able to go there. I think I had a college membership back then. It was like maybe $23 for college students. And they had exercise classes that you can go to for an hour. Now being the size that I was, I didn't know anything about treadmills, ellipticals, stairmasters. I didn't know how to do any of that. So it was easy for me to just go into the class that was already programmed. You already have somebody in there telling you what to do after you do your hour, you go. I tried all the classes, spin, didn't like the bike. Um, I think it was like a boot camp class. I wasn't in the physical shape to be doing all that. Um, so, and then it was yoga. I was like, man, this is, this is kind of quiet stretching. Not for me, not my thing. Um, so I went into a Zuma class 
And at first I was kind of lost because I'm used to dancing, but learning the choreography where you break mm -hmm. it down, you learn, you practice. Zumba is not like that. With Zumba, you go in and they're just pointing you in directions. Now I know it's cueing, but you just, you're, they're just, just pointing. So when I went into Zumba, I'm like, okay, I like to dance. I didn't know what Zumba was when I went into Zumba. I just seen it on the schedule. And I went in, I was like, okay, so this is dancing to music. And it's, of course, a lot of Latin music. Shout out to Beto. Um, he is the creator and founder of, of, of Zumba, and he's from Colombia. So it's more Spanish nice. rhythms, like merengue, salsa, reggaeton, bachata, um, cumbia. So it was more Latin music. Mm -hmm. So it was the only class that I felt like I was able to really move and not feel like I was hurting, have fun. And then also I was I sweat real good. So I started going, kept going. And then um, that same instructor, she started teaching at the college for free in the in the gym. So then that was another way for me to take Zumba because at the Y, it was only once a week. So then it turned into I had access to her three times a week. because She was teaching at school twice a week um, and then went into her class, learned all her choreography because I was there faithfully to because that, that was my workout. And um, Angela, shout out to Angela. She walked up to me and she said, hey, um, so every now and again, we'll get these emails about students in our class that we feel that should be instructors to get a 65% off to go ahead and get certified. And she's like, I couldn't think of anybody else but you. Because at that time, whenever she was running late, she would have me warm up the class. Whenever she was like behind or she would let me teach a couple of songs or I would teach with her because I knew her music because I was a faithful in her class. So, but at that time, in between blessings, I couldn't afford to do the membership at the time. So when we moved to Pensacola and I was still like trying to find Zumba classes in Pensacola, there were like hardly any. So then I reached out to her and I said, hey, you know, I'm in Pensacola and, you know, really looking for some Zumba classes in the area. They're not there's not too many. Is that 65 percent off available? If not, when it comes back around, let me know. Um, but again, God being a God of timing, when I messaged her it fell right into like, I think it was like a week left on the coupon. And she was like, I haven't even shared it with anybody because I haven't really found anyone that I feel like would love Zumba enough to become an instructor. So she gave me the code. I went to Biloxi, Mississippi. My supportive husband drove me way to Mississippi, which was like 90 minutes away from where we lived. All day got, got licensed, certified. And that was um, a little over five years ago. And with Zumba, I've been able to, it's still ministry, you know, after class, I still get a chance to love on people. You know, I've had people come up to me and say, you know, um, I just, I just couldn't wait to get to your class today. I got some bad news. My daughter got Baker racks. you know, I'm going through a divorce. I'm having a hard time, you know, but I just knew if I could just get to your class, your energy, something about you. And mind you, I'm not there, you know, the minister, I'm just an instructor. You know, you have to have that balance and that, you know, just time and place for everything. But I've had yeah. people come up to me like, hey, are, are you a believer? Because there's something different about you. Um, and I say all that to say, when you carry God, you ain't got to announce him. He'll make an announcement for you. Amen. Um, but that's how that started. And from, from there, um, I just came back last March from a Zumba cruise with Royal Caribbean. Um, we, you know, I taught a couple classes on ship there. And then it was another instructor on the ship as well. Yale, we, we got a chance to link up together. It was about a hundred people in a skating ring area that they turned into a big dance floor, had a good time. And I'm getting ready to go to Mexico next March for my second Zumba cruise. Um, and I love it. I mean, I get a chance to incorporate my style, my artistry, you know, my culture, my country, you know, like we get a chance to like, that's what I love about Zumba is you have music that you can use, but you can also make it true to who you are and like the music that you love. And I teach weekly classes here. I think in a week I probably dance with, anywhere between 40 to 50 people a week. Um, and it's just been, it's been a blessing. And it's also, you know, therapeutic it's bad there too. You know, I, I also get some, you know, I, I get paid. To oh, do what I love. <laughs> oh, let's go. Let's I go. Get, I, I get paid to be, you know, active and healthy. Um, but the biggest blessing of it is if I had to do it free, I would do it. Cause I just really love what I do. Yeah. But I'd rather you get paid for it. You know, uh -oh. and I'm wrong with the <laughs> You know, if they want right. to add a little bit more, you know, All right. here, I'll do there, it for free, I'll... but the, the pain part, let's, let's keep it like that. Yeah, you yeah. know, it's it, 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 it's been a blessing. It's been a blessing.
especially with the Zumba community and the Zumba world, like you have people in Korea, Japan, China. Yeah, 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 big, yeah, like big. It's, it's everywhere. And it all started with a, a dancer in Colombia by the name of Bethel who went to audition and forgot his audition tape and knew that this audition was how he was going to make a better life for himself, not knowing that that tenacity to push through the unknown and just dance based on the beat and cue his dancers because they didn't know the choreography because that wasn't what they practiced. It started this whole movement that has created jobs for other people, that has created opportunities for other people. And it's just like a big family. So um, I also share that if, if, if you're a dreamer and you have a dream, don't give up on it. Just keep pushing because I'm a part of Bethel's dream. And I think I met him once, but Zumba takes care of a lot of things in my life, even down to just the mental health part for me. Like, it's 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 great. Y'all should come to the Zumba class and y'all should come to my cruise. Everybody on here that like to cruise, like to travel, y'all mm -hmm. should come to this cruise with me. If you got kids, kids can cruise for free if they're under 12. You know, how okay. Like, oh, okay, yeah. okay, let's, okay. Let's, 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 let's make this happen. We go. <laughs> let's hey, make this as happen. As long as so we Sam, get this. You could bring Janelle. You could bring SJ. You. you know, I let's do you. this. I got you. So we're just going to ask you for this tap in discount. And we end it like swimwear, you know? Listen, you know, <laughs> I, I got you. I got you. Even if the tap in discount is an anointed prayer that God will bless your life. <laughs> that God will anoint you and, and all the money that you put in to, to, to bless the woman of God and her cruise, that God give it back to you 100 fold. We tap in. You know what? We're going to receive that. <laughs> Go ahead and receive that. We going to tap in. That's it, man. Flo, we could sit here and talk all night, man. Like, but it was a blessing to to have you on here. Absolutely. Uh, and thank you for being open to share your testimony. And I do hope that you know somebody will hear it. I know that for a fact, man, because God God does not make mistakes. You Absolutely. know, so definitely somebody will be blessed, and somebody that was in a dark place uh, is gonna be able to crawl out of it. You know, due to this testimony. So thank you so much for being open and sharing. Absolutely. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you for the safe space. Um, thank you for just being open to it because when it comes to sharing trauma, you know, sometimes it's it's hard to open up like yeah. that. But you all have been, you know, even even your quiet, you know, committee members back there. Um, just for just today, <laughs> I'm telling you. It's just when we have guests. I don't get it. This I'm surprised Milo he cried. The way Milo we exactly. all got the same They did the same thing to Marlene. Like it's like every time somebody's coming on as a guest, they do this. And I'm like, everybody's talking about how they the, they, they the best. Yeah. Show. Right, right. Everybody's talking see about that? how you know they are the best talk show person. You know they the best of the best, and y'all are the best. Mute. We are mute. <laughs> oh. <wow. laughs> That's crazy. But, but it, it, was some... an, it was an honor to be able to share my story. Um, and for anyone who has lost a parent, you know, um, you with, with God, you can get through it. I remember the days telling my mom's story and I couldn't even get through the first words. It was just yeah. waterworks, tears, hyperventilating. But, you know, um, I just thank God to be in this place where I can share the story and get it out and still do it with power and you know, emotion and be successful with it. So thank you for the opportunity. You and tapped in yeah. the mute committee. Man, th Ooh, thank, nice thank, thank, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> we, you would need, you need to go. So if you would ask some questions, all would have hit midnight. <laughs> it would have hit midnight. <laughs> That's your bit, but they muted the whole time though, so like <laughs> <laughs> But um, th this is the question that we ask every guest uh, before we go. Uh, what is your message to the world, Flo? Ooh, I've never had nobody ask me that. Um, hey, tap in. Got hey, look, we in there. <laughs> we in there. I would say my message to the world, it's something that I end all of my Wednesday morning prayers with. And it's probably not, you know, in the most proper pronunciation and all of the verbal etiquette but my message to the world is there ain't a second that god is not good 
There's not a second in your day. I don't care what you're going through. I don't care what you lost. I don't care who you lost. I don't care about the trauma. Not, not, not to disrespect what you're going through, but at the end of the day, on your worst day, if you sit and try to find a second, not a minute, if you sit and try to find a second that God is not good, I am willing to pay you if you can report back to me a second that God ain't good. You ain't going to find one. Amen. He is good all, all the time. time. All That's the time. My world that's what i say every wednesday there ain't. and we're gonna put that on the shirt man. hey y'all put it on the shirt i'm glad we're that putting this it on, the on the shirt. facebook live and instagram <laughs> and the people can know that oh, that is flowing the word yes yeah, flowing the, flow the word there we're gonna give you credit we don't take nobody's credit <laughs> no 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 i'm gonna put it on the shirt and y'all just buy it I need to copy like that. <laughs> there ain't one second. Hey, that's what, whoever printed first, you know, wins. I Don't think worry that's about it. Works. You know, all, everything that's mine is under the blood. And you can't have <laughs> You can't. What God has for me, it is for me. But there oh, ain't. Oh, let's go. There ain't one second. All of y'all on Instagram, y'all put that in, 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 in the chat and in the comments. There ain't <laughs> one second that God is not good. And make sure you put it in quotations and then comma or dash flow. Because that's flow. mine. That's my flow. There um, X, X, tap second. in. Flow, no, X, no. tap in. <laughs> no. no. Flow and y'all tap out. <laughs> <laughs> not uh, one second. God is not good. That's my message to the world. That's my way. That, that's my message after prayer. And that's something that God spoke to me um, that even 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 in losing my mom and life after that and the journey, because I haven't even told you all to have. There was more trauma. And even that even in that, when I go back to even finding or knowing that my mom was laying in her own, blood, even in those seconds, God was still good. Even yeah. in that, God was still good. Like there ain't like. There, there will never be a moment, not even a millisecond, where God ain't good. Like, in tragedy and trauma, in in in, in misfortune, like God, he that's that's what makes him God is the fact that nothing can taint how good he is. That's my message to the world. Uh, message received. Mic yeah. drop. Like you're done. So I, I mean, we we had a great uh, discussion. Thank you so much, uh, Flo, for interacting with me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> and 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 the mute. We had an audience for sure. Um, but I hope this is not 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 our last sit down. Uh, hopefully, one day we can get you here live. Um, that'll be that'll be great. You know, so we're gonna keep praying on that. Um and man, I don't know. Thank thank you. Thank you. Just thank you. Um yeah. I don't have the words to say right now, okay. but just thank you. Thank you. And thank y'all for this again, space and opportunity, trusting me with your audience, trusting me with your platform. Um, and I just pray that I did the platform and the audience right. Um, just based on the spirit. Yes, you did. <laughs> hands down, hands down. <laughs> Hands down, you did. This is this was our first time going live. Okay, we've never done that before. Uh, shout out, big shout out to my boy Jeff, right? Because this man, this man worked tirelessly, man, to to get this going, and and still before we went on, like I told you, like we delayed because we could we couldn't get it to work. But by the grace of God, uh, we like he figured it out. I don't know why we. I'm saying we because we didn't do nothing. <laughs> you know, he figured it out, and you know, and this is gonna be an opportunity for us to to have conversations with other people as well that cannot be in the studio. So this is a first for tap in, and I'm glad it happened with you. So oh, thank man. you, thank you, thank you, and I and I appreciate it. And we made it through the technical difficulties. Yes, we, we did. Yes, we did. Thank you guys for your patience. And with that being said, this was Sam uh, Tapping with Flo and the Tapping Crew. And we're saying good night. <laughs> <laughs>
tap to tap to tap. Tap in. Let's go. Yeah.